fiction writing, you often hear a plea that the personal must extend outward beyond the self, as though this isn't in fact the very work of essaying, as if something more must be done to keep the ratio of writer to, as it seems to be conceived, reality in correct proportion on the page. We explicitly demand of nonfiction writers in a way that we do not of people working in other genres that they make a connection with the world politically, culturally, or perhaps some of the wilder implorers seem to suggest merely to justify its existence. Eulabus's writing transcends the conversation about the personal external divide. It erases any distinction between the two. Speaking about her new book on immunity, she told NPR that it's a social critique, but it started out as a self-critique. This is the premise that makes her essaying so compelling, so revealing, and yet so firmly rooted in reality. The self and the society can be commuted between with ease, are equally open to the same type of inquiry. They are, as subjects, actually inextricable. To read Eulabis is to revel in a thrillingly curious mind. Her subjects have included the invention of the telephone, gentrification in Chicago, college culture, and most recently, immunizations. You never know what associations you'll emerge from a Eula Biss book with, how you might connect telephone poles with lynching, gentrification with Laura Ingalls Wilder, or vaccinations with Dracula. Even when the I is more implicit than explicit, this is always complicit in what she writes about, a complicit self being the kind that's most exciting to read, offering authority and voyeurism in equal parts. We know, for instance, that her account of college culture emerges from working as a graduate instructor here at the University of Iowa, and that the investigation of immunizations originated in a choice she would have to make as a new mother. The rejection of a line between the self and the subject, that is, between the self and society on every page, in every sentence, has always struck me as, in fact, deeply radical, on a political level as much as an aesthetic one. This has employed note sections in her books, but they don't just supplement the text or provide evidence, although they do do that. They also illuminate, often in surprising ways, the process of Biss's thinking how she came to write the essay or passage, how she ended up writing the essay or passage, and how the writing of it changed her. Carl Klaus wrote that the essay has always been more of a workshop than a museum, a concept I spent at least a year struggling with before realizing it was embodied in the very book kept beside my bed, that that was the reason I kept it there. Because I could see the parts being made, the ideas taking shape, and it wasn't just helpful as a writer, but deeply riveting as a reader. This gives us the most personal and also the most persuasive thing of all, a narrator writing clearly to understand, and so a kind that compels you to understand, too. Eula Biss, who holds an MFA in nonfiction from the University of Iowa, is the author of three books, The Balloonist, Notes from No Man's Land, American Essays, and On Immunity and Inoculation. She's been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Howard Foundation Fellowship, an NEA Literature Fellowship, and a Jaffe Writers Award. Her essays have appeared in The Best American Non-Required Reading, The Believer, Gulf Coast, and Harper's, and more. She teaches at Northwestern University. Welcome, Eula Biss. Um, so, this book is in part about contagion, and I have a terrible cold. Um, so, this is the first time I'm going to be reading about contagion under the influence of contagion. Um, this book is written in 30 very short sections, and I'm going to um, jump from between three of them for you. And thanks for all cramming in here. I've been reading from this book for a while, and for a while I was finding all these contorted ways of trying to, to patch it together into a reading that could fit into the right amount of time. And I was really torturing the book, and then a, a former student of mine came to a reading and she said, why don't you just start at the beginning? And it had honestly never occurred to me, never occurred to me to just start at the beginning of the book, which is the beginning for a reason, so that's what I'm going to do for you now. 
The first story I ever heard about immunity was told to me by my father, a doctor, when I was very young. It was the myth of Achilles, whose mother tried to make him immortal. She burned away his mortality with fire in one telling of the story, and Achilles was left impervious to injury everywhere except his heel, where a poisoned arrow would eventually wound and kill him. In another telling, the infant Achilles was immersed in the river Styx, the river that divides the world from the underworld. His mother held her baby by his heel to dip him in the water, leaving again one fatal vulnerability. When Rubens painted the life of Achilles, the river Styx is where he began. Bats fly across the sky of that painting and the dead ride a ferry in the distance. Achilles dangles from his mother's hand by one plump leg with his head and shoulders entirely underwater. This is clearly no ordinary bath. The three-headed hound who guards the underworld lies curled at the base of the painting where the baby's body meets the river as if the baby is being plunged into the beast. Conferring immunity, the painting suggests, is a perilous task. To prepare her children for the hazards of life, my own mother read Grimm's fairy tales aloud to us every night before bed. I don't remember the brutality for which those tales are famous as vividly as I remember their magic. The golden pears growing in the castle garden, the boy no bigger than a thumb, the twelve brothers who became twelve swans, but it didn't escape my notice as a child that the parents in those tales have a maddening habit of getting tricked into making bad gambles with their children's lives. In one story, a man agrees to trade with the devil whatever is standing beyond his mill. He thinks he's giving away his apple tree, but to his dismay he finds his daughter standing beyond the mill. In another story, a woman who has been longing for a child becomes pregnant and craves a plant called Rapunzel that grows in the garden of a wicked enchantress. The woman sends her husband to steal the plant, and when he's caught, he promises their future child to the enchantress, who locks the girl away in a tall tower with no door. But maidens locked in towers will let down their hair. And so it was in the Greek myths that my mother read to me later. A king who had heard an ominous prophecy couldn't keep his daughter childless by locking her in a tower. Zeus visited her in the form of a shower of gold that left her pregnant with a child who later killed the king. When the infant Oedipus, left on a mountainside to die, was saved by a shepherd, he was not saved from the prophecy that foretold he would kill his father and marry his mother. And Thetis, Achilles' mother, could neither burn nor drown his mortality. A child cannot be kept from his fate, though this doesn't stop the gods themselves from trying. Achilles' mother, a goddess who married a mortal, heard a prophecy that her son would die young. She made every effort to defy that prophecy, including dressing Achilles as a girl during the Trojan War. After he took up a sword and was discovered to be a boy, his mother asked the god of fire to make a shield for him. This shield was emblazoned with the sun and the moon, the earth and ocean, cities at war and peace, fields plowed and reaped. The universe with all its dualities was Achilles' shield. The story my father told me when I was young was not the myth of Achilles, he reminds me now, but another ancient story. As my father relates the plot, I understand why I confuse the two. The hero of this story is made immune to injury by bathing in the blood of a dragon, but a leaf clings to his body while he bathes, leaving a small spot on his back where he's unprotected. After having been victorious in many battles, he's killed by one blow to this spot. Immunity is a myth, these stories suggest, and no mortal can ever be made invulnerable. The truth of this was much easier for me to grasp before I became a mother. My son's birth brought with it an exaggerated sense of, my, of both my own power and my own powerlessness. I found myself bargaining with fate so frequently that my husband and I made a game of it, asking each other what disease we would give our child for prevention against another. 
a parody of the impossible decisions of parenthood. When my son was an infant, I would hear many variations of all that matters is that he's safe. I would wonder whether that was indeed all that mattered nearly as often as I would wonder if I could keep him safe. I was certain that I didn't have the power to protect him from his fate, whatever it might be. But I was determined nonetheless to avoid the bad gambles of the Grimm's tales. I wouldn't let my child be cursed by my own carelessness or cupidity. I wouldn't accidentally say to the devil, you may have what is beyond the mill, only to discover that what is standing beyond the mill is my child. I'm going to skip ahead so we can get to the vampires. <laughs> An 1881 handbill titled The Vaccination Vampire warns of the universal pollution delivered by the vaccinator to the pure babe. Known to feed on the blood of babies, the vampires of that time became a ready metaphor for the vaccinators who inflicted wounds on infants. Blood-sucking monsters of ancient folklore were hideous, but Victorian vampires could be seductive. The macabre sexuality of the vampire dramatized the fear that there was something sexual in the act of vaccination, an anxiety that was only reinforced when sexually transmitted diseases were spread through arm-to-arm -arm vaccination. Victorian vampires, like Victorian doctors, were associated not just with corruption of the blood, but also with economic corruption. Having virtually invented a paid profession and being almost exclusively available to the rich, doctors were suspect to the working class. Bram Stoker's Count Dracula is clearly of the bloodthirsty bourgeois. He keeps dusty piles of gold coins in his castle, and gold coins pour from his cloak when he's stabbed. But it's difficult to read him as a vaccinator. Of all the metaphors suggested within the plentiful pages of Dracula, disease is one of the most obvious. Dracula arrives in England just as a new disease might arrive, on a boat. He summons hordes of rats, and his infective evil spreads from the first woman he bites to the children she feeds on, unwittingly, at night. What makes Dracula particularly terrifying, and what takes the plot of the story so long to resolve, is that he is a monster whose monstrosity is contagious. Germ theory was widely accepted by 1897, when Dracula was published but only after having been ridiculed earlier in the century. The suspicion that microorganisms of some sort cause disease had been around for so long that the theory was already considered outdated by the time Louis Pasteur demonstrated the presence of germs in the air with his corked and uncorked flasks of sterile broth. Among the vampire hunters who pursue Dracula, sterilizing his coffins so that he can't take refuge in them, are two doctors who initially disagree on their diagnosis. The young doctor can't bring himself to believe in vampires despite the evidence, so the older doctor delivers an impassioned speech on the intersection of science and faith. In the film version, this doctor is played um, with a wonderful accent that I can't reproduce here, but Imagine the, the version of Dracula with Bela Lugosi, and um, the, the scientist has a fantastic, I think it's supposed to be Austrian accent. Let me tell you, my friend, he says, that there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. He then goes on to evoke Mark Twain, I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. He meant that we shall have an open mind and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. Dracula is as much about this problem, the problem of evidence and truth, as it is about vampires. In proposing that one truth may derail another, it invites an enduring question. Do we believe vaccination to be more monstrous than disease?
In the first few weeks after my son was born, a March wind blew off the lake and through our apartment, where I sat for hours each night in a stiff wooden rocking chair, rocking my restless baby and staring at the windows through which I could barely see the shadows of tree limbs flailing in the wind. The chair creaked and the wind moaned and I heard a tapping at the glass and a flapping around the sill and I knew a vampire was there trying to get in. By daylight, I would be reminded that a flagpole was near that window, with a flapping flag and a tapping line, but in the moment, I felt terror. I was calmed only by my belief, instilled by a recent vampire movie, that the vampire could not enter without my permission. I avoided mirrors in the dark. When I slept, I woke from bloody nightmares, and I saw things moving that were not moving. During the day, I began to think the lake was singing to me. It was a single, low tone that only I could hear. I was as disquieted by this as I was comforted. I kept two tall glass liter jars of drinking water on the table next to my rocking chair. Staring at the jars as I nursed the baby, I recalled being told in the hospital that I'd lost two liters of blood it remained a mystery to me how anyone could have known how much blood I lost, because it went all over the floor. My husband would describe to me much later the sound it made, the lapping of small waves as the blood puddled and the nurses pushed at the edges of the pool with towels. But I never saw any of it, never even heard the lapping sound, so those two glass liter jars were my only measure of what I had lost. Vampires were in the air then. True Blood was a new television series, and The Vampire Diaries was about to premiere, while the Twilight Saga played out in a series of books I didn't read by movies I didn't see, followed by movies I didn't see. A car parked on my block had a bumper sticker that read, Blood is the New Black, and on my first visit to the bookstore after giving birth, I noticed a new section devoted exclusively to vampire novels for teenagers. Vampires were part of the cultural moment, but as a new mother I became fixated on them, in part because they were a way for me to think about something else. The vampire was a metaphor, though it's hard to say whether it was a metaphor for my baby or for myself. My baby slept by day and woke at night to feed for me, sometimes drawing blood with his toothless jaws. He grew more vig vigorous each day even as I remained weak and pale. But I was living off blood that was not mine. Immediately after my son's birth, in an otherwise uncomplicated delivery, my uterus inverted, bursting capillaries and spilling blood. After giving birth without any medical intervention, without painkillers or an IV in place, I was rushed to surgery and put under general anesthesia. I woke up disoriented, shivering violently under a pile of heated blankets. That happens to everyone who comes down here, my midwife observed from a bright and hazy place above me, inadvertently reinforcing my sense that I had, indeed, gone down to the banks of the river Styx. Where is down here? I kept wondering. I was too weak to move much, but when I tried, I discovered that my body was lashed with tubes and wires. I had an IV in each arm, a catheter down my leg, monitors on my chest, and an oxygen mask on my face. Alone in the recovery room, I slipped into sleep, waking with the unnerving sensation that I'd stopped breathing. Machines were beeping around me. A nurse fiddled with the machines, mentioning that she thought they might be malfunctioning because they seemed to be indicating that I had stopped breathing. I coughed and couldn't catch my breath, struggling to say help before I passed out. A doctor was standing at the foot of my bed when I came to, and it was decided that I would receive a transfusion. This excited the nurse, who told me that transfusions are like magic. She had seen the color come back into gray people after they had received transfusions. She had seen people who couldn't move sit up and ask for food. Without using the words life or death, 
She let me know that she had seen the dead come back to life. I didn't feel like I was coming back to life as the refrigerated blood entered my veins. I felt an ominous cold ache spreading from my arm towards my chest. People aren't usually awake for this, the doctor said when I mentioned the temperature of the blood. He was standing precariously on a stool with wheels, improvising a rig that would hold the bag of blood closer to the ceiling so that gravity would pull it into my body more quickly. By hospital policy, my baby couldn't be in the recovery room with me, and the doctor couldn't change that, but he could try to devise a way to get the blood into me faster so that I could leave the recovery room sooner. My vision began to blacken around the edges, my stomach turned, and the room spun around me. This was all normal, the doctor told me. Remember, he said, it's not your blood. There are many explanations for the extreme fearfulness I felt in the weeks after my son's birth. I was a new mother. I was far from my family. I was anemic. I was delirious with fatigue. But the true source of my fear eluded me until months later when I went out on Lake Michigan in my little canoe made of bent wood covered with a transparent canvas. I'd been on the lake many times before in that boat, and I'd never been afraid. But this time my blood was pounding in my ears. I was newly aware of the immensity of the water under me, its vast cold depths, and I was painfully aware of the fragility of my boat. Oh, I thought to myself with some disappointment, I'm afraid of death. Vampires are immortal, but they're not exactly alive. Undead was the term Bram Stoker used for Dracula. Frankenstein and zombies and any number of animated corpses are all undead rather than immortal in the manner of Greek gods. The term undead amused me in the months when I was recovering from my son's birth, a time when I frequently found reason to think of it. I was alive, and gratefully so, but I felt entirely undead. Nitroglycerin was injected into me during the surgery that repaired my uterus. The same thing that's used in bombs, my midwife reported. <laughs> I wanted the IV lines out of my arms as soon as I left the recovery room so that I could hold my son comfortably, but the midwife explained that I needed intravenous antibiotics to prevent infection. You've had a lot of people's hands in you, she said frankly. Some of the hands were hers, in me to help deliver the baby and the placenta, but then there was also my surgery, which was performed exclusively with human hands, leaving no incisions. When I learned this, it struck me as both magical and mundane that the technology that had saved me was simply hands. Of course, our technology is us. You've had a lot of people's hands in you, was a phrase I would hear in my mind for a long time after that surgery, along with, remember, it's not your blood. My pregnancy, like every pregnancy, had primed me for the understanding that my body was not mine alone, and that its boundaries were more porous than I'd ever been led to believe. It was not an idea that came easily, and I was dismayed by how many of the metaphors that occurred to me when I was pregnant were metaphors of political violence, invasion, occupation, colonization. But during the birth, when the violence to my body was greatest, I was most aware not of the ugliness of a body's dependence on other bodies, but the beauty of it. Everything that happened to me in the hospital after my son's delivery, even things I understand now as cold or brutal, I experienced at that time as a glow with humanity. Alarms were sounded for me, doctors rushed to me, bags of blood were rigged for me, ice chips were held to my lips. Human hands were in me and in everything that touched me, in the nitroglycerin, in the machines that monitored my breathing, in the blood that wasn't mine. If you want to understand any moment in time or any cultural moment, just look at their vampires, says Eric Newsom author of The Dead Travel Fast. 
Our vampires are not like the remorseless Victorian vampires who had a taste for the blood of babies and didn't seem to feel badly about it. Our vampires are conflicted. Some of them go hungry rather than feed on humans, and some of them drink synthetic blood. Almost all of these current vampires are struggling to be moral, the journalist Margot Adler observed after immersing herself in vampire novels and vampire television for months after her husband's death. It's conventional to talk about vampires as sexual, with their hypnotic powers and their intimate penetrations and their blood drinking and so forth, she reported. But most of these modern vampires are not talking as much about sex as they are about power. Power, of course, is vampiric. We enjoy it only because someone else does not. Power is what philosophers would call a positional good, meaning that its value is determined by how much of it one has compared to other people. Privilege, too, is a positional good, and some have argued that health is as well. Our vampires, whatever else they are, remain a reminder that our bodies are penetrable, a reminder that we feed off of each other, that we need each other to live. Our vampires reflect both our terrible appetites and our agonized restraint. When our vampires struggle with their need for blood, they give us a way of thinking about what we ask of each other in order to live. All right, that's it. If you have a question for you, Liz, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over to you um, so you can ask her just kind of a general question. Um, you are a product of the nonfiction writing program here. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's anything, this is a little loud, isn't it? Um, I'll turn this down a little. Is there anything about your writing that you've noticed that is um, particularly distinctive to being a product of this program or is there anything you've noticed in other uh, graduates of the nonfiction program? I don't know. It's kind of like asking, like, how did your parents make you who you are? Um, I, I'm sure that there is a part of my writing that's informed by this program. My thesis advisor is right here, David Hamilton, um, and I'm very grateful to him for the, the years I spent sitting in his office. Um, one of the things that I owe to the program, and probably David specifically, is that um, the program let me fail. Um, and I, I was writing a book uh, when, I, when I entered, and that I worked on for several years, all the way until my thesis year. And, um, and at the last minute, really the 11th hour, I realized that it wasn't the book I should be writing. And I said that to David. Um, and I think some other thesis advisor would say, well, you've come this far, why don't you just finish it? And, um, and the, that book was about marriage, and um, I had decided that I wanted to get married, but I had also decided I no longer wanted to write the book about marriage. And, um, and David said, eh, you didn't get a book out of it, but you got a marriage out of it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and, um, and I feel very grateful for that. Um, in that I was allowed to write a failed book and abandon the failed book when it was clear to me that it was a failed book and then um, move on and, and write the next book. And now, a, a little farther down the line, I know that lots of writers have books that they uh, store in the closet or under the bed and books that they've written that they're never planning to publish. And that, that that's part of what the education of becoming a writer is, is writing a book you're never going to show to anyone. Um, so I, f I do feel very grateful to the program for allowing me to do that. And, and I do think that that education is, the education of having written something that didn't work is, is all over my more successful work. Um, I think that I, I learned who I was in doing that. Um, so. Yeah, I guess that's my roundabout answer. Excellent. Um, so I have a question. Um, it seems like 
a lot of uh, this book is about choices and control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what struck to me a lot was like the mothers that you would talk to um, mm -hmm. about their choices to vaccinate or not vaccinate, mm -hmm. and um, especially positing like individual choice and like individualism versus like community. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering how um, how do you approach writing about like one person's individual choice while also making like the scope of it like the the effect of it like more universal yeah um i guess lodged within that question is i think this kind of fallacy in the way we think about individuals and collectives so we somehow manage to think about individuals as if collectives aren't built of individuals so you know like here's individual and here's the collective but really it's 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 all one, you know. The the individual's body is also the collective's body, and um, and so I guess that was how I was trying to address that problem. And here was was by insisting as often as I could, and that no, actually, it, th there is not a separation here. The, the the individual is the collective, and the collective is made up of individuals, and. Um, and that's mirrored in the form of the book. So for a while, I was, I was, um, I, I was confused by why this book is is made up of thirty little sections um, that don't really. No one of these sections will stand alone, and um, and that's not just my impression. When this book was was about to be published, some magazines and journals wanted to excerpt it, and I thought, oh well, perfect. There's thirty little pieces, and you can each have one. Um, <laughs> And none of the journals or magazines that looked at it wanted to publish them because none of the pieces will actually stand alone. So the, every editor who looked at one of these 30 pieces said, this is great, but it feels unfinished. So could you do something else to it to make it feel finished? And I thought, well, the thing that needs to be done to it is it needs to be rejoined with its 29 companions. And that's what's going to make it feel done. Um, and so, but for a while I was wondering, you know, why is this book taking this form and then I realized oh these sections are like us they're like humans they're they're both independent and then you can see their edges and you can see that they're um, each one of them has a subject um, but they're also inherently independent they 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 really can't their ideas can't be completed if they're set aside from from the context that they belong in so that's also how I was trying to think in this book as you know each one of us individuals has a context, and we can't really think of ourselves outside of that context. I guess we can just hypothetically, but it's like thinking about walking through outer space. You know, you can think about it, but you can't do it. So it's it's just an intellectual exercise. Um, but I do think that sometimes when it comes to these issues, we have a fantasy of ourselves in a vacuum um, or uh, in an, some unpopulated space um, where our health will not be affected by other people's contagious bodies or their health won't be con infected by our contagious bodies. And um, there is, I, I do think that this subject does challenge some of how we want to think about contagion and health. And I do think we, we like to think of ourselves as in charge of our health and our bodies. and. Um, the the dark side of that is something that Susan Sontag has written about in that when people are ill um, we're very quick to blame them for for their illness and we like to see illness as something that people have done to themselves not something that happens to a person um, and th there's I can think of a, a dozen problems with that mindset that way of thinking about health um, but one of them is that it leads to this kind of supposition that we get to choose whether we're healthy or sick, and um, and that that isn't that doesn't fall in line with what's observed in the population at large. And um, people, despite all their good choices and righteous actions, will get sick, even who people who've led up till that moment very healthy lives. And so, I do think when we think about this, it, it makes the part of us that wants to be in charge and in control kind of bristle and think, no, that won't happen to me, um, or not my child. Um, it, and that's what makes, I, th I think, it so challenging to talk about. 
Um, what do you think your doctor meant when he said, remember, it's not your blood? Mm. Well, I think what he was trying to communicate was that um, I, I think we also expect a lot out of medicine. We expect medicine to um, do everything it does for us with no, um, with no downside, you know, and so uh, the nurse had already talked about how wonderful transfusions are and how much better I'd feel after I got it, um, but the doctor was reminding me you know, there, there is a downside to this, and that's that you're, you're taking this foreign matter into your body, and that's part of what's going on. You're feeling weird because your body's getting quite a bit of material right now that is not you, and, um, and is having to deal with that. And there is very rarely, there's something that can happen to people who get transfusions where their body rejects that blood. Um, and it's incredibly serious, but that wasn't what was going on. My body was just disoriented, kind of like, what is this stuff and what do I do with it? Um, but I think he was trying to remind me, remember, this is, this is kind of a big deal. Like, not only is this not your blood and that's why you feel weird, but, um, but when he said that, I also was reminded, oh, somebody gave this to me. Somebody, um, for no benefit to themselves, went and had their blood extracted from their body so that I could get this treatment. And um, it was a very sobering moment for me in that way. And um, as much as having a child contributed to writing this book, I think that um, going through surgery and a transfusion really informed how I thought about um, the situation of, of needing something from the collective or, or needing care. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time thinking about um, my own gratitude towards this anonymous donor who had given this blood um, that, uh, that in the moment I felt like the blood saved me. I felt like I couldn't breathe and once I got the blood I was breathing again. And, um, and I, I, I thought about this person whose, whose motivations I didn't know or understand who had given this um, very precious substance. Um, to me and given it just into this public pool, you know, uh, whoever needs this should use it. And um, if for me that became a really powerful metaphor for immunity and, and I see that as something like what we're doing when we volunteer to not be carriers of disease. So that's part of what we're doing when we vaccinate ourselves is we're volunteering to not be disease vectors. And I think in that way we contribute to a collective pool of immunity that does protect certain people who cannot be immunized. Um, so, and those people fall into lots of categories. The very young, the very old, um, HIV positive people, people with compromised immune systems, people under treatment for cancer, people who have received organ transplants. So there's a whole variety of categories of people who can't be vaccinated. And um, the rest of us make a donation to them when we vaccinate ourselves. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm wondering if you ever <clears throat> perceived the, the work as a form of <coughs> immunization like in itself? Yeah, um, I have come to, you know, the subtitle is an inoculation. Um, and I, I initially that was a joke between me and me. I was just <laughs> fooling around. <laughs> Um, and I, I thought that it was funny to call the book itself an inoculation. Um, but my editor liked it, and he liked it so much that I started trying to take it seriously. And, um, and when I did start to take it seriously, I thought about, there was one aspect of the book that had been bothering me a little bit, and that's that in order to talk about fears of vaccination, I had to repeat a number of those fears. And I had to repeat a number of fears that had been really unproductive for me as a new mother. And I didn't like the idea of then repeating these fears and having them reach some other new mother who they would also be unproductive for. Um, so I really struggled with, you know, how do I write this book about these fears without saying them again? And then when I started to think about the book as an inoculation, it occurred to me that it could work the way a vaccine works so that a little bit of the thing that you're trying to protect against could be introduced to the person, and in that way the person could be protected from an onslaught of that thing. So um, the idea was that I would give people a little taste of the fears around vaccination, 
but the the intention would be to protect people from a real kind of becoming um, you know overwhelmed by unbridled fears of vaccination. Hi, I uh, mean this question in all seriousness. Why did you choose not to read the Twilight Saga? Oh. <laughs> Gosh, I don't know. I mean, why do you choose not to read anything? I'm, it's, I guess it just wasn't one of the things that made it through my... Um, I'm thinking of the books that I read as like a river of books that flow through my house, and Twilight was not one of them. Um, I didn't think I was that interested in, in vampires, actually, until I read Dracula. Um, and I should thank Robin Schiff, who's sitting here, who is my vampire supplier. Um, actually, once when I was leaving Iowa City, she had her entire vampire library and uh, was trying to encourage me to stuff it into my backpack, like 40 pounds of vampire literature. Um, and I kept saying, no, no, two books. Two books is enough. So I guess I was trying, I was kind of pushing vampires away even as I was seeking them out. Um, but yeah, it was, Twilight just never made it in. Um, though I, I read lots of other vampire works and also maybe it had something to do with Robin's curation. Maybe I'll blame Robin for the fact that I didn't read Twilight. And I, I instead read a lot of, um, of 19th century vampire works and, um, and that's, that's kind of Robin's era. So <laughs> I, I'm blaming it on you. <laughs> Hi, over here in the corner. Um, I'm just wondering if, as a writer writing about science and history mm -hmm. and vampires, rather than a scientist or a vampire writing, um, how, was there ever a moment where you sort of came across a level of feeling more of an authority figure in immunity or medicine just through all of your research and yeah. um, maybe just meditating <coughs> you know, enough hours for yeah. Becoming an authority in that realm. It's a good question. I, there were moments when I was treated like an authority and they, they've only ever made me nervous. Um, because the, the more I learned and, and, uh, and the more I came to understand, uh, the, better I, the better I understood how little I knew and, and how little context I had for my own knowledge. And so um, at one point, I, I came back here to Iowa City um, to talk to a professor of immunology um, who, who helped me a great deal um, in writing this book. And, um, and I did get a much better grasp from him on, on what's going on in the immune system, how it works. But I also got a grasp of how huge the subject is. And I remember leaving that meeting thinking, I should have gotten interested in anything else, like a brain science, anything else, because, you know, at least in brain science, it's located to this one organ, you know, and with the immune system, it's many organs, many systems, and uh, the, the ways that these things are working together are incredibly complicated. Um, and so, no, really, the, the more I learned, the less authoritative I felt. Um, and the more nervous I felt about being treated as an authority, enough so that my husband said that he would make me a button to wear to readings that said, I'm the essayist, not the expert. Yeah, that was it. I'm the essayist, not the expert. Just so I would be distinguished from someone who actually knew something about the subject. <laughs> um, I was wondering from your older essays, which mm. one was your favorite mm. and why? Hmm. That's a hard question. Um, there's definitely ones I don't like um, <laughs> anymore. And, um, you know, I, I have continued to like for quite a long time the, the title essay of, of No Man's Land, Notes from No Man's Land, which is titled No Man's Land. Um, and there's things I would change now, but. Um, why do I like it? Um, I think it's it, it's about something that remains complicated for me, and um, and I still live in the place it's about. And some of the the questions that essay is asking are questions that are still relevant in my life. And so, I do feel like I can still return to that piece, and it has something to to give me. Um, 
and there's a few others in that collection that I, that I don't mind um, <laughs> re-encountering. <laughs> I was wondering about the economical side of mm. immunity and care. Mm. Like yeah. it seems in your book that you are doing an elegy mm. of care and, and being aware of the other and being aware of how we're all intertwined. All yeah. that. But um, it happens to be a very expensive thing, at mm. least in this country. I was wondering if you <coughs> have thought of or what's your take on, on the economical side of, of immunity. Yeah. Of that yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting question, and it was something I thought about and, and read about a certain amount. Um, <clears throat> and what's interesting is that immunization, vaccination is probably one of the least representative areas in, in terms of the problems with the economics of healthcare in our country. I think that there's huge problems, um, and s some of them ranging into the kind of unconscionable territory. Um, but for instance, when I first started writing this book, I thought, why don't I trace um, the, the money involved in, in one vaccination? I thought that I would do this kind of journalistic thing. And right away I got um, kind of stymied because I looked at um, my son's uh, health care records and realized we'd never been charged for any of his vaccinations. So um, they all happened at well baby appointments, which um, under our health care plan are free. And so we went into a free appointment and were given vaccinations and never paid anything. Um, and there's quite a few services. You know, one of the things that, that leads um, lower income groups are sometimes better vaccinated than higher income groups. Um, it depends on where you are and it's hard to make generalizations about this, but in, in some of the, the um, breakdowns of the demographics of vaccination that I've looked at, that's true. And that can be true in some places because there, most states, and then there's also federal programs, will supply people with free vaccination. Um, so in many cases, this is preventative health care that is getting paid for. Um, and that many, um, many physicians groups will absorb the cost of vaccines, um, in part because it saves money in other ways. So. Um, you know, someone it recently, uh, the Chicago Tribune ran an article, I think, um, about how much it costs for one person to have measles and how much it costs kind of the public sector. And, um, and it costs a lot because uh, there's all these efforts have to go into preventing other people to, from getting measles. And I've seen various breakdowns of how much one case of measles costs, but it's around $10,000. Um, and so, compared to what the measles vaccine costs, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly what a healthcare provider pays for that, um, and it's probably different from provider to provider, um, but many individuals pay nothing for it, um, and, um, and the, the society as a whole is saved money by the use of that preventative medicine. So it's not a great example of some of the truly evil stuff that is going on. Um, it, with pharmaceutical companies and, and their manipulation of prices. And um, as someone who uses asthma medication, I have a lot of complaints about the way that um, inhalers, that the price of inhalers is being gamed by various insurance companies and um, by pharmaceutical companies. But in this one case, you know, I know there's people who are kind of uh, applying their resistance to the problems with the economics of medicine to vaccination. Vaccination really actually isn't a good example of those problems. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in form throughout the scope of your work. Um, in a lot of your earlier pieces, there's a lot of associative leaping and jumping in sections, whereas in this book, there isn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how your relationship with form evolved in this book, mm -hmm. um, and there seems to be a great, and there's care throughout all of your work, but specifically this book seemed very mm -hmm. careful in how is issues were presented, mm -hmm. and so I was curious about how that works. Mm. You should talk to all the people who have um, reviewed it on Amazon and say that it makes no sense and it jumps all over the place. So. <laughs> um, you know, it is different. I, I think that the 
the way that the chapters are arranged, I think I'm far less associative within each section, each um, of these 30 sections. Um, and that's in part because when, you're, when you take these kind of leaps of association, you have to trust that a reader is with you and following you. And some readers will be and some won't, um, as Amazon evidences. But, um, it, but there's places where it, it, that kind of movement in an essay can, can generate ambiguity, and some of that ambiguity can be rich and interesting. Um, but in this particular work, I, there were places where I didn't want a lot of ambiguity, and I wanted to be as clear as possible on certain things. Um, and when I move from chapter to chapter, there usually is an associative movement there, and, um, and that's the place where when people don't understand why the book looks the way it does, they don't understand why I go from one thing to another. And so people are saying, wait, she was talking about vampires a second ago, and now she's talking about um, you know, uh, H1N1, and now she's talking about um, the history of women in medicine. This doesn't make any sense, what's going on? Um, and that is because y there are people who don't think that way, you know, who don't think in an associative way. And so associative moves are super confusing to that kind of thinker. Um, and in some of my other work, yeah, it's m I allow myself those leaps within the, the body of the text. It's not just between portions of the text. And, um, and that's usually because in those works, I'm comfortable with the, the ambiguity that generates. And, um, and sometimes there's, there's other kind of reasons driven by my goals as an artist. You know, there's some places where I want a silence or I want a suggestive space that is suggesting an idea to the reader but not telling that idea to the reader. Um, and there were, in this book, there were a number of places where I could have done that, and I chose to <laughs> phrase the idea instead of just suggesting it. Um, I found it interesting how, when you initially um, opened your statement, that you, um, that you compared this, this topic to Greek mythology. And me, and I'm very interested in mythology, and I kind of was curious as to why you um, compared the power of immunity to the, to the power of fate and prophecies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that part that I read in, at, from the beginning um, was written very late in the process of writing this book. And part of how I got there is I was thinking, um, I was thinking about how old I feel like this story is, this, this story of how do we protect our children, um, what, will, um, what will give my child the best and longest life. This, uh, and I started to think, this, this is an old anxiety, and, and I know that I've heard stories about this before. And I started um, running through my memory banks, and because my parents had read Greek myths to me, one of the first things that came up was um, was a series of myths that seemed to speak to um, the, that question, and especially Achilles. To me, um, in that moment where I was a new mother, I was really reading Achilles as a, as a cautionary tale. Um, and it, to me, the message was, and many Greek myths are about this, right? This struggle with fate, you know? And it happens over and over again that something is prophesied. Um, and then the human, uh, out of our humanness, we try to wriggle out of our fate, right? And, and the, oh, again and again in those Greek myths, it's shown that you don't escape your fate. You just don't. Um, and what's going to happen to you is going to happen to you. It might happen like it did with Oedipus in a way that you'd never imagined. Um, and your parents might not even know what's happening because you've come back to town a stranger. Um, and your mother willingly marries you because she doesn't know that you're her son. Um, but to me, that, that reminded me of the kind of futility of um, this parenting project that's about protecting your children against everything, everything the bad that can happen to them. And I, I felt that I needed to make peace with the reality that, that my son might have a fate and that it might be a fate that I was not in control of. Um, and that nobody would be in control of, and that things would happen to him that um, that you know I, I, that I couldn't foresee or prevent, and that that's 
that's just part of the anguish of parenting, you know, going all the way back to Thetis and Achilles. Okay, we have two last questions. Um, I'm wondering how you see this book in relation to your previous book, mm -hmm. and I'm also wondering what you found pleasurable while writing mm -hmm. this new book. Thanks, yeah. Um, you know, at first I thought I was writing an, a totally new book. Um, that had very little in common with my previous book. The, the subject matter felt very different. I thought, well, now I'm in the sciences. I was in the humanities before. Um, and the tone and style are different. Um, the approach is different. I, I've had a mirage that lasted a while that this book had no relationship to the last book. And um, it didn't take long. I, you, not very far into this book, there's a, a chapter that's dedicated to um, the, the social justice and, and racial implications of uh, a person refusing vaccination. And when I hit that moment in my writing, I realized, oh, this is actually an extension of my work on race and on social justice. And in some ways, um, I thought it was a refinement of my earlier book in that the, the book no, Notes from No Man's Land opened a lot of questions, and one of the questions that it opened for me and that, that I felt like I carried throughout that series of essays was this question of how, how can I, as a, as a white person and as someone who's been born into a certain amount of privilege, how can I use that privilege in, in ways that are socially responsible and, and maybe even sometimes refuse that privilege in ways that are responsible to the people around me? Um, and that was a question that had come, come up to the surface in that collection that it, I didn't feel satisfied that I'd found any kind of real world action um, that would satisfy that question, that would be an answer. And what was interesting to me about writing and thinking about vaccination was I felt like, oh, here's, here's an answer. It's, you know, it's an answer in one tiny realm. But here's a place where I can, as a member of a dominant social group, as a member of a majority, I can take some risk and um, accept something into my body that will protect a minority. And with vaccination, the minority isn't always a racial minority, right? So sometimes you're protecting a minority age group. So when you're vaccinated against um, pertussis, you're protecting newborn babies. When you're vaccinated against rubella, you're protecting um, pregnant women. Uh, when you're vaccinated against influenza, you're protecting the elderly. Um, but there is also, uh, there are situations where you're also protecting, in some cases, um, minority, racial minorities as well. And I, I, I basically just loved the idea that this is written into the whole system of mass vaccination, that a majority is willingly protecting a minority. Um, and I thought that, that was the place where I re really felt a deep kind of theoretical connection with my earlier work. A question that came up earlier about your authority reminds me of a moment that uh, occurred here years ago before your time here that's worth retelling because it applies to you. Another writer of nonfiction was here and at a dinner before the reading someone at the dinner challenged him what was your authority for writing what you've written and he drew back and said experience and he was corrected in an instant by another at the table, Jory Graham, who said, no, the sentence. <laughs> I've always relished that. Oh, that so, is great. As a truth about being an essayist, wherever you are, or a poet. And it's been a pleasure to listen to you read your sentences that have changed somewhat in my time of reading them. You've been speaking to that in your most recent remarks there's much more connectivity in them than there used to be. Um, do you attribute that mostly to the material you've taken up, mm -hmm. to an audience you want to reach, or anything else you'd like to say about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, David. Um, I think it's the material. I, I've, and I really did, I felt myself itching while I was writing this book 
to write the kind of sentence that I was writing before, a looser sentence or a sentence that took some more leaps or even leaps between sentences. And sometimes it was out of, I had to be responsible to the information I was handling sometimes. Um, and the information needed to be contextualized. That was part of the project of a, a chapter or a moment in the book. And, um, and the first thing I did as soon as this was done is started making jottings that, you know, are, are, they're no, no sort of project right now, but they're, they're very loose and very associative and there's no information in them at all. And it's just me trying to like exercise, I guess, my poetry muscle again. Um, after having felt a little bound by information. And some of it was that relationship to information and some of it was the relationship to argument as well. And um, that I was, I was trying to talk about ideas in here and I wanted the idea to be clear. Um, and, and sometimes I, I think clarity trumped other kinds of, um, I, I guess other projects that a, that a writer could have, but I'd love to have those projects again and go back to being less clear. Um, but I love Jory's remark about the sentence. I, I often have students ask me, you know, how do you get authority? How do you, often they phrase it as how do you earn authority? And I keep telling them, I'm not sure people do earn authority. You, you just take it or you don't. And, um, you, you can choose to take it or you can choose not to. And there is something interesting about a work that refuses authority too. Thanks, David. Eulipus will be happy to talk with you and sign books for you. So thank you.